Guild A guild is an association of artisans or merchants who oversee the practice of their craft slash trade in a particular area. The earliest types of guild formed as a confraternity soft tradesmen. They were organized in a manner something between a professional association, a trade union, a cartel, and a secret society. They often depended on grants of letters patent from a monarch or other authority to enforce the flow of trade to their self employed members, and to retain ownership of tools and the supply of materials. A lasting legacy of traditional guilds are the guild halls constructed and used as guild meeting places. Guild members found guilty of cheating on the public would be fined or banned from the guild. An important result of the guild framework was the emergence of universities at Bologna, established in 1088, Oxford, at least since 1096, and Paris, circa 1150. They originated as guilds of students, as at Bologna, or of masters, as at Paris. A type of guild was known in Roman times. Known as collegium, collegia or corpus, these were organized groups of merchants who specialized in a particular craft and whose membership of the group was voluntary. One such example is the Corpus Navicularum, the college of long-distance shippers based at Rome's La Ostio port. The Roman guilds failed to survive the collapse of the Roman Empire. In medieval cities, craftsmen tended to form associations based on their trades, confraternities of textile workers, masons, carpenters, carvers, glass workers, each of whom controlled secrets of traditionally imparted technology. The arts or mysteries of their crafts. Usually, the founders were free independent master craftsmen who hired apprentices. There were several types of guilds, including the two main categories of merchant guilds and craft guilds, but also the Frith Guild and Religious Guild. Guilds arose beginning in the High Middle Ages as craftsmen united to protect their common interests. In the German city of Augsburg, craft guilds are being mentioned in the town charter of 1156. The continental system of guilds and merchants arrived in England after the Norman conquest, with incorporated societies of merchants in each town or city holding exclusive rights of doing business there. In many cases they became the governing body of a town. For example, London's Guild Hall became the seat of the Court of Common Council of the City of London Corporation, the world's oldest continuously elected local government whose members to this day must freemen of the city. The freedom of the city effective from the Middle Ages until 1835, gave the right to trade, and was only bestowed upon members of a guild or livery. Early egalitarian communities called guilds, for the gold deposited in their common funds, were denounced by Catholic clergy for their conjurations the binding oaths sworn among the members to support one another in adversity, kill specific enemies, and back one another in feuds or in business ventures. The occasion for these oaths were drunken banquets held on December 26. The Pagan Feast of July, Yule, in 858, West Francian Bishop Himar sought vainly to Christianize the guild. In the early Middle Ages, most of the Roman craft organizations, originally formed as religious confraternities, had disappeared, with the apparent exceptions of stonecutters and perhaps glassmakers, mostly the people that had local skills. Gregory of Tours tells a miraculous tale of a builder whose art and technique suddenly left him but were restored by an apparition of the Virgin Mary in a dream. Michel Rouche remarks that the story speaks for the importance of practically transmitted journeymanship. In France, guilds were called corps de métiers. According to Victor Ivanovich Rotenberg, within the guild itself there was very little division of labor, which tended to operate rather between the guilds. Thus, according to Etienne Boileau's Book of Handicrafts, by the mid-13th century there were no less than 100 guilds in Paris, a figure which by the 14th century had risen to 350. There were different guilds of metal workers, the farriers, knife makers, locksmiths, chain forgers, nail makers, often formed separate and distinct corporations, the armorers were divided into helmet makers, escutcheon makers, harness makers, harness polishers, etc. in Catalan towns, especially at Barcelona. Guilds or Gremis were a basic agent in the society a shoemaker's guild is recorded in 1208. In England, specifically in the City of London Corporation, more than 110 guilds, referred to as livery companies, survive today, with the oldest more than a thousand years old. Other groups, such as the Worshipful Company of Tax Advisors, have been formed far more recently. Membership in a livery company is expected for individuals participating in the governance of the city, as the Lord Mayor and the Remembrancer.
The guild system reached a mature state in Germany circa 1300 and held on in German cities into the 19th century, with some special privileges for certain occupations remaining today. In the 15th century, Hamburg had 100 guilds, Cologne 80, and Lübeck 70. The latest guilds to develop in Western Europe were the of Spain for example, Valencia, 1332, or Toledo, 1426. Not all city economies were controlled by guilds, some cities were free. Where guilds were in control, they shaped labor, production and trade, they had strong controls over instructional capital, and the modern concepts of a lifetime progression of apprentice to craftsman, and then from journeyman eventually to widely recognized master and grandmaster began to emerge. In order to become a master, a journeyman would have to go on a three-year voyage called journeyman years. The practice of the journeyman years still exists in Germany and France. As production became more specialized, trade guilds were divided and subdivided, eliciting the squabbles over jurisdiction that produced the paperwork by which economic historians trace their development. The metalworking guilds of Nuremberg were divided among dozens of independent trades in the boom economy of the 13th century, and there were 101 trades in Paris by 1260. In Ghent, as in Florence, the wool and textile industry developed as a congeries of specialized guilds. The appearance of the European guilds was tied to the emergent money economy, and to urbanization. Before this time it was not possible to run a money-driven organization, as commodity money was the normal way of doing business. The guild was at the center of European handicraft organization into the 16th century. In France, a resurgence of the guilds in the second half of the 17th century is symptomatic of the monarchy's concerns to impose unity control production and reap the benefits of transparent structure in the shape of more efficient taxation. The guilds were identified with organizations enjoying certain privileges, letters patent, usually issued by the king or state and overseen by local town business authorities, some kind of chamber of commerce. These were the predecessors of the modern patent and trademark system. The guilds also maintained funds in order to support infirm or elderly members, as well as widows and orphans of guild members, funeral benefits, and a tramping allowance for those needing to travel to find work. As the guild system of the City of London declined during the 17th century, the livery companies transformed into mutual assistance fraternities along such lines. European guilds imposed long standardized periods of apprenticeship, and made it difficult for those lacking the capital to set up for themselves or without the approval of their peers to gain access to materials or knowledge, or to sell into certain markets an area that equally dominated the guild's concerns. These are defining characteristics of mercantilism in economics, which dominated most European thinking about political economy until the rise of classical economics. The guild system survived the emergence of early capitalists, which began to divide guild members into haves and dependent have-nots. The civil struggles that characterized the 14th century towns and cities were struggles in part between the greater guilds and the lesser artisanal guilds, which depended on piecework. In Florence, they were openly distinguished, the Arti Maggiore and the Arti Minori already there was a Popolo Grasso and a Popolo Magro. Fiercer struggles were those between essentially conservative guilds and the merchant class, which increasingly came to control themians of production and the capital that could be ventured in expansive schemes, often under the rules of guilds of their own. German social historians trace the Zunft Revolution, the urban revolution of guild members against a controlling urban patriciate, sometimes reading in Totham, however, perceived foretastes of the class struggles of the 19th century. In the countryside, where guild rules did not operate, there was freedom for the entrepreneur with capital to organize cottage industry, a network of cottagers who spun and wove in their own premises on his account, provided with their raw materials, perhaps even their looms, by the capitalist who took a share of the profits. Such a dispersed system could not so easily be controlled where there was a vigorous local market for the raw materials, wool was easily available in sheep rearing regions, whereas silk was not. In Florence, Italy, there were 7 to 12 greater guilds and 14 lesser guilds. The most important of the greater guilds was that for judges and notaries, who handled the legal business of all the other guilds and often served as an arbitrator of disputes. Other greater guilds include the wool, silk, and the money changers guilds. They prided themselves on a reputation for very high-quality work, which was rewarded with premium prices. The guilds fine members who deviated from standards. Other greater guilds included those of doctors, druggists, and furriers. Among the lesser guilds were those for bakers, saddle makers, iron workers, and other artisans. They had a sizable membership, 
but lacked the political and social standing necessary to influence city affairs. The guild was made up by experienced and confirmed experts in their field of handicraft. They were called master craftsmen. Before a new employee could rise to the level of mastery, he had to go through a schooling period during which he was first called an apprentice. After this period, he could rise to the level of journeyman. Apprentices would typically not learn more than the most basic techniques until they were trusted by their peers to keep the guilds or companies' secrets. Like journey, the distance that could be traveled in a day, the title journeyman derives from the French words for day, jour and journée, from which came the Middle English word journée. Journeymen were able to work for other masters, unlike apprentices, and generally paid by the day and were Thursday laborers. After being employed by a master for several years, and after producing a qualifying piece of work, the apprentice was granted the rank of journeyman and was given documents, letters or certificates from his master and or the guild itself, which certified him as a journeyman and entitled him to travel to other towns and countries to learn the art from other masters. These journeys could span large parts of Europe and were an unofficial way of communicating new methods and techniques, though by no means all journeymen made such travels, they were most common in Germany and Italy, and in other countries journeymen from small cities would often visit the capital. After this journey and several years of experience, a journeyman could be received as master craftsman, though in some guilds this step could be made straight from apprentice. This would typically require the approval of all masters of a guild, a donation of money and other goods, often omitted for sons of existing members, and the production of a so-called masterpiece, which would illustrate the abilities of the aspiring master craftsmen, this was often retained by the guild. The medieval guild was established by charters or letters patent or similar authority by the city or the ruler and normally held a monopoly on trade in its craft within the city in which it operated. Handicraft workers were forbidden by law to run any business if they were not members of a guild, and only masters were allowed to be members of a guild. Before these privileges were legislated, these groups of handicraft workers were simply called handicraft associations. The town authorities might be represented in the guild meetings and thus had a means of controlling the handicraft activities. This was important since towns very often depended on a good reputation for export of a narrow range of products, on which not only the guilds, but the town's reputation depended. Controls on the association of physical locations to well known exported products, for example, wine from the Champagne and Bordeaux regions of France, tin glazed earthenwares from certain cities in Holland, lace from Chantilly, etc., helped to establish a town's place in global commerce. This led to modern trademarks. In many German and Italian cities, the more powerful guilds often had considerable political influence, and sometimes attempted to control the city authorities. In the 14th century, this led to numerous bloody uprisings, during which the guilds dissolved town councils and detained patricians in an attempt to increase their influence. In 14th century northeast Germany, people of Wendish, i.e. Slavic, origin were not allowed to join some guilds. According to Wilhelm Rabe, down into the 18th century, no German guild accepted a Wend. As Ogilvy, 2004, shows, the guilds negatively affected quality, skills, and innovation. Through what economists now call rent-seeking they imposed deadweight losses on the economy. Ogilvy says they generated no demonstrable positive externalities and notes that industry began to flourish only after the guilds faded away. Guilds persisted over the centuries because they redistributed resources to politically powerful merchants. On the other hand, Ogilvy agrees, guilds created social capital of shared norms, common information, mutual sanctions, and collective political action. This social capital benefited guild members, even as it hurt outsiders. The guild system became a target of much criticism towards the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. They were believed to oppose free trade and hinder technological innovation, technology transfer, and business development. According to several accounts of this time, Guilds became increasingly involved in simple territorial struggles against each other and against free practitioners of their arts. Two of the most outspoken critics of the guild system were Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Adam Smith, and all over Europe a tendency to oppose government control over trades in favor of laissez-faire free market systems was growing rapidly and making its way into the political and legal system. The French Revolution saw guilds as a last remnant of feudalism. The Le Chapelier Law of 1791 abolished the guilds in France. Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations, Book I, Chapter 10, Paragraph 72. Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto also criticized the guild system for its rigid gradation of social rank and the relation of oppressor slash oppressed entailed be this system. 
From this time comes the low regard in which some people hold the guilds to this day. In part due to their own inability to control unruly corporate behavior, the tide turned against the guilds. Because of industrialization and modernization of the trade and industry, and the rise of powerful nation-states that could directly issue patent and copyright protections, often revealing the trade secrets, the guilds' power faded. After the French Revolution they fell in most European nations through the 19th century, as the guild system was disbanded and replaced by free trade laws. By that time, many former handicraft workers had been forced to seek employment in the emerging manufacturing industries, using not closely guarded techniques but standardized methods controlled by corporations. Guilds are sometimes said to be the precursors of modern trade unions. Guilds, however, can also be seen as a set of self-employed skilled craftsmen with ownership and control over the materials and tools they needed to produce their goods. Guilds were more like cartels than they were like trade unions, Olson 1982. However, the journeyman organizations, which were at the time illegal, may have been influential. The exclusive privilege of a guild to produce certain goods or provide certain services was similar in spirit and character with the original patent systems that surfaced in England in 1624. These systems played a role in ending the guild's dominance, as trade secret methods were superseded by modern firms directly revealing their techniques, and counting on the state to enforce their legal monopoly. Some guild traditions still remain in a few handicrafts, in Europe especially among shoemakers and barbers. Some ritual traditions of the guilds were conservative in order organizations such as the Freemasons, allegedly deriving from the Masons Guild, and the Odd Fellows, allegedly derived from various smaller guilds. These are, however, not very important economically except as reminders of the responsibilities of some trades toward the public. Modern antitrust law could be said to derive in some ways from the original statutes by which the guilds were abolished in Europe. The economic consequences of guilds have led to heated debates among economic historians. On the one side, scholars say that since merchant guilds persisted over long periods they must have been efficient institutions, since soon efficient institutions die out. Others say they persisted not because they benefited the entire economy but because they benefited the owners, who used political power to protect them. Ogilvy, 2011, says they regulated trade for their own benefit, were monopolies, distorted markets, fixed prices, and restricted entrance into the guild. Ogilvy, 2008, argues that their long apprenticeships were unnecessary to acquire skills, and their conservatism reduced the rate of innovation and made the society poorer. She says their main goal was rent-seeking, that is, to shift money to the membership at the expense of the entire economy. Epstein and Prax's book, 2008, rejects Ogilvy's conclusions. Specifically, Epstein argues that guilds were cost-sharing rather than rent-seeking institutions. They located and match masters and likely apprentices through monitored learning. Whereas the acquisition of craft skills required experience-based learning, he argues that this process necessitated many years in apprenticeship. The extent to which guilds were able to monopolize markets is also debated. For the most part, medieval guilds limited women's participation and usually only the widows and daughters of known masters were allowed in. Even if a woman entered a guild, she was excluded from guild offices. It's important to note that while this was the overarching practice, there were guilds and professions that did allow women's participation, and that the medieval era was an ever-changing, mutable society, especially considering it had it spanned hundreds of years in many different cultures. There were multiple accounts of women's participation in guilds in England and the continent. In a study of London silk women of the 15th century by Marion K. Dale, she notes that medieval women could inherit property, belong to guilds, manage estates, and run the family business if widowed. The Livre des Maches de Paris, Book of Traits of Paris, was compiled by Etienne Boileau, the Grand Provost of Paris under King Louis IX. It documents that five out of 110 Parisian guilds were female monopolies and that only a few guilds systematically excluded women. Boileau notes that some professions were also open to women, surgeons, glassblowers, chainmail forgers. Entertainment guilds also had a significant number of women members. John, Duke of Berry documents payments to female musicians from Le Puy, Lyons, and Paris. Women did have problems with entering healers' guilds, as opposed to their relative freedom in trade or craft guilds. Their status in healers' guilds were often challenged. The idea that medicine should only be practiced by men was supported by the Catholic Church, royal heads, and secular authorities at the time. 
It is believed that the Inquisition and witch hunts throughout the ages contributed to the lack of women in medical guilds. Scholars from the history of ideas have noticed that consultants play a part similar to that of the journeymen of the guild systems, they often travel a lot, work at many companies and spread new practices and knowledge between companies and corporations. Professional organizations replicate guild structure and operation. Professions such as architecture, engineering, geology, and land surveying require varying lengths of apprenticeships before one can gain a professional certification. These certifications hold great legal weight, most states make them a prerequisite to practicing there. Thomas W. Malone champions a modern variant of the guild structure for modern e-lancers, professionals who do mostly telework for multiple employers. Insurance including any professional liability, intellectual capital protections, an ethical code perhaps enforced by peer pressure and software, and other benefits of a strong association of producers of knowledge, benefit from economies of scale, and may prevent cutthroat competition that leads to inferior services undercutting prices. And, as with historical guilds, such a structure will resist foreign competition. The free software community has from time to time explored a guild-like structure to unite against competition from Microsoft, for example Advogado assigns journeyer and master ranks to those committing to work only or mostly on free software. In many European countries guilds have experienced a revival as local organizations for craftsmen, primarily in traditional skills. They may function as forums for developing competence and are often the local units of a national employer's organization. In the city of London, the ancient guilds survive as livery companies, all of which play a ceremonial role in the city's many customs. The City of London livery companies maintain strong links with their respective trade, craft or profession, some still retain regulatory, inspection or enforcement roles. The senior members of the City of London livery companies, known as liverymen, elect the sheriffs and approve the candidates for the office of Lord Mayor of London. Guilds also survive in many other towns and cities the UK including in Preston, Lancashire, as the Preston Guild Merchant where among other celebrations descendants of Burgesses are still admitted into membership. With the City of London livery companies, the UK has over 300 extant guilds and growing. In 1878 the London Livery Companies established the City and Guilds of London Institute the forerunner of the engineering school, still called City and Guilds College, at Imperial College London. The aim of the City and Guilds of London Institute was the advancement of technical education. City and Guilds operates as an examining and accreditation body for vocational, managerial and engineering qualifications from entry-level craft and treaty skills up to postdoctoral achievement. A separate organization, the City and Guilds of London Art School has also close ties with the London Livery Companions and is involved in the training of master craft workers in stone and wood carving, as well as fine artists. In Germany there are no longer any Zunft, or Gilden, the terms used were rather different from town to town, nor any restriction of a craft to a privileged corporation. However, under one other of their old names albeit a less frequent one, in Jungen, Guilds continue to exist as private member clubs with membership limited to practitioners of particular trades or activities. These clubs are corporations under public law, albeit the membership is voluntary. The president normally comes from the ranks of master craftsmen and is called Obermeister, master in chief. Journeymen elect their own representative bodies, with their president having the traditional title of Altgesell, senior journeyman. There are also craft chambers, handworks commerce which have less resemblance to ancient guilds in that they are organized for all crafts in a certain region, not just one. In the membership is mandatory, and they serve to establish self-governance of the crafts. In the United States guilds exist in several fields. In the film and television industry, guild membership is generally a prerequisite for working on major productions in certain capacities. The Screen Actors Guild, Directors Guild of America, Writers Guild of America, East, Writers Guild of America, West and other profession-specific guilds have the ability to exercise strong control in the cinema of the United States as a result of a rigid system of intellectual property rights and a history of power brokers also holding guild membership, for example, DreamWorks founder Steven Spielberg was, and is, a DGA member. These guilds maintain their own contracts with production companies to ensure a certain number of their members are hired for roles in each film or television production, and that their members are paid a minimum off-guild scale along with other labor protections. 
These guilds set high standards for membership, and exclude professional actors, writers, etc. who do not abide by the strict rules for competing within the film and television industry in America. The Newspaper Guild is a labor union for journalists and other newspaper workers, with over 30,000 members in North America. Real Estate Brokerage offers an example of a modern American guild system. Signs of guild behavior in real estate brokerage include, standard pricing, 6% of the home price, strong affiliation among all practitioners, self-regulation, see National Association of Realtors, strong cultural identity, see Realtor, little price variation with quality differences, and traditional methods in use by all practitioners. In September 2005 the U.S. Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit against the National Association of Realtors, challenging NAR practices that, the DOJ asserted, prevent competition from practitioners who use different methods. The DOJ and the Federal Trade Commission in 2005 advocated against state laws, supported by NAR, that disadvantage new kinds of brokers. U.S. v. National Associates of Realtors, Civil Action No. 5 C5140 and Deal. SEP.7, 2005. The practice of law in the United States also exemplifies modern guilds at work. Every state maintains its own bar association, supervised by that state's highest court. The court decides the criteria for entering and staying in the legal profession. In most states, every attorney must become a member of that state's bar association in order to practice law. State laws forbid any person from engaging in the unauthorized practice of law and practicing attorneys are subject to rules of professional conduct that are enforced by the state's high court. Medical associations comparable to guilds include the state medical boards, the American Medical Association, and the American Dental Association. Medical licensing in most states requires specific training, tests and years of low-paid apprenticeship, internship and residency. Under harsh working conditions. Even qualified international or out of state doctors may not practice without acceptance by the local medical guild, medical board. Similarly, nurses and physicians practitioners have their own guilds. A doctor cannot work as a physician's assistant unless, as he separately trains, tests and apprentices as one. Australia is home to several guilds, including the Australian Butchers Guild a fraternity of independent butchers, which provides links to resources like Australian meat standards and a guide to different beef cuts. Another guild is the Pharmacy Guild of Australia, created in 1928 as the Federated Pharmaceutical Services Guild of Australia, which serves 5,700 community pharmacies, while also providing training and standards for the country's pharmacists. Australia's craft guilds include, among others, the Australian Directors Guild, representing the country's directors, documentary makers and animators, the Australian Writers Guild, and the Artists Guild, a craft guild focusing on female artists. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.